Coming up on Wrestling Life. If there was a way that I could go back in time, knowing what I know now, I would have made a different choice. But to be really honest, and this is what people have a hard time with, being honest with themselves. If you put yourself, if one puts oneself in my shoes, in that moment, with that information, under those conditions, I'm not proud of my decision, but I'm not embarrassed by it either. I did the best I could with what I had in that moment. Welcome to Wrestling Life with Ben Veal, the show that features real talk from real talent. Hello, one and all. Thank you for joining me for some more Real Talk from Real Talent. And for the first time ever, we have a returning guest here on Wrestling Life. He's back. He's better than ever. He's one of the most influential and controversial figures in the pro wrestling industry. And he joins me today to share some memories from his Hall of Fame career. Mr. Eric Bischoff, you're back. Thanks for joining me. I'm back. I'm not going to sing my intro because my voice sucks, but yeah, I'm back and better than ever. I'm really glad to see you again. I, mean, I, I loved the conversation we had last time. We talked lots about kind of um, your perspective on what matters in life today, your attitude of gratitude, but we left a lot of questions on the floor and um, I'm hoping we can take a bit of a trip down memory lane today and talk about some old school wrestling stuff from your life. I look forward to it. I had so much fun last time. I've really been looking forward to doing this episode. I'm so pleased to hear that, but I'm going to get it up to date first. So obviously the first thing we have to talk about I've just finished binge watching it with my wife. And that is, of course, the Mr. McMahon Netflix documentary. Um, now, the fact that my wife watched it says a lot because she does not watch anything to do with wrestling. Um, but we both came out of that um, six parts of that series. Um, her with very little wrestling knowledge, me with a lot. Both feeling pretty underwhelmed and unsatisfied by the whole piece really um uh, my feeling was that it kind of barely scraped the surface of anything that i wanted to know about um but you featured in a lot of the episodes and you came across very positively um i wondered how you landed on it kind of having watched the final edit back and how it compared to what you were expecting when you were doing all those interviews with netflix yeah i mean i i appreciated the documentary for what a documentary is and how they're produced and and the story that they try to tell. I think it was very well edited. I think the producers did absolutely the best job possible. Mm. Given that, and people have to keep in mind, so much of what we heard from Vince McMahon was prior to the most recent controversy and, and allegations. Yeah. And, it was evident to me it may have been lost on others who don't haven't worked with Vince and been around him for any length of time. It was evident in the documentary to me and I think to others who have worked with Vince, but so much of all of those interviews that we heard from Vince, in my opinion at least, weren't designed from Vince's perspective to give us any real insight as to how he thinks or how he works it was more a branding initiative. It was it was the perception, and Vince talked a lot about reality and perception. It was the perception, therefore the reality, that Vince was attempting to create for his brand, mm-hmm. meaning he wanted us to hear the stories about him and his father. He wanted us to hear about some of the infidelity. He wanted us to hear how he reacts to certain things that is so much different than the average person might. Those are all things I think Vince, if it makes sense to other people or not, Vince wanted to project the image that he projected Mm. in that documentary because he didn't know what was coming. Yeah. So I think, I think we got glimpses, brief glimpses, almost like photographs in terms of who Vince McMahon really is and how he really thinks. But it was overshadowed by a lot of the perception that Vince McMahon was trying to create. So I I don't think we got to know Vince McMahon real well. We got little glimpses of him. And I think people that have worked with Vince in the past 
probably recognize those glimpses much more than people who have never been around Vince. Mm. But there was a, and, and even the producers, you know, Bill Simmons and, and the other gentleman came out right away and said, look, we didn't produce this for knowledgeable wrestling fans. We produced this for a worldwide audience on Netflix. And as of right now, more than 5 million people around the world have watched that documentary. Mm. And a good portion of them are not wrestling fans and maybe had never really thought too much about it. And that's what they were producing for. So I understand why people who are like you, who have been following the business and following Vince's you know, career over the years and all, all of the things that are going on, didn't learn anything new. It's all, this is the WCW Nitro story, the Monday Night War story, you know, a lot of the stories we've heard before. But you got to keep in mind that 90% of the rest of the audience haven't. So for them, it may be a little bit more fulfilling. Um, now, your wife is an example of someone who is not a wrestling fan, who didn't know what you know, who was also underwhelmed. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that given the recent allegations and controversies, we wanted more of that. That's what we were really hoping to see. And that's that situation is ongoing. It's There's no resolution. There's no ending to that story as of yet. So it's kind of hard, especially with all of the litigation and everything that's going on, it's kind of hard to dig into that story with too much detail because, it, number one, it hasn't been resolved yet. And there's a lot of question marks. And number two, Vince wasn't going to talk. Vince couldn't have talked about it in this documentary because it didn't exist when this thing was produced and when those interviews were produced. So I think to that extent, I think the average person consciously or subconsciously was really expecting something powerful with regard to the recent allegations. And it's just not possible yet. When you were pitched to be on the documentary, how, how is it, how is it pitched to you that we're looking at Vince McMahon's life and everything he's accomplished in wrestling? Was that I was never asked to be a part of the documentary. The footage that you saw of me uh, and, and my comments were all from a completely different set of interviews I did for a completely different project. Nice. It's just that those interviews happened to fit okay. into the narrative that was being presented in this documentary. Uh -huh. So they, they, they repurposed footage that was never intended to be a part initially because I wouldn't have agreed. I wouldn't have wanted to have been, a part. I'm, I'm not a big fan of these types of exposés and unless it's something relatively positive, uh, it's just not my thing. I don't. I don't like to. I don't like yeah, to be that, participant in 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 mudslinging. I just don't. No, and it, and and it felt like it fell into two camps. It was either um, lots of talking heads that were either saying how fantastic Vince was or the mudslinging camp. And well, as you often find in those kind of talking head documentaries that's that's what you got it's just a really, it's really interesting to see the kind of types of people they brought in but i think ben one of the things that that makes you know i did an interview when i worked uh for vince directly i reported directly to vince uh back in 2019 and shortly after i got to wwe and took the position i did an interview with a writer i think it was a newspaper writer on the east coast and said hey it was a very short interview it was like hey how would you describe vince mcmahon and I said then, the same thing I'll say now, he is without question one of the more complex human beings I've ever been within geographical proximity to. He is incredibly complex because there are some really, there's some good things about Vince. He's done some really good things for people that people don't know about. He's never wanted publicity for it. He's never wanted to be acknowledged. In fact, he goes to an extent, an extreme to make sure that if he does something positive for someone, everybody knows you're not supposed to talk about it. But he does have a heart, even though he's presented as someone who doesn't. He does. I think part of Vince McGann, and I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not, I, I have no training or anything other than just having been around the block for 70 years <clears throat> and I like to observe people and patterns. I think part of the reason Vince likes to project this aura of invincibility and, and almost he's almost impenetrable in terms of getting to know who he is. That's in my opinion, a defense mechanism. 
I think there's a very broken human being somewhere deep down inside all of the bravado and all of the aggressiveness. There is a man with a heart. Unfortunately, there's also the other side that I think is, is partly as a result of some of the trauma that Vince went through early in life. And it's easy to dismiss that as an excuse. But when you're four, five, six, eight, 10, 12 years old, and you're being beaten by your stepfather and sexually abused, that scar tissue doesn't go away on its own. That takes some real professional help and commitment in a long time to overcome mm. and, and not allow those things and that damage to affect you the rest of your life. And I think that is a part of the reason why the control, if you look at some of the allegations, and they're just allegations at this point, we haven't heard the other side of the coin. It's really easy to jump on allegations, especially ones that were that graphic and, and hard to even read. Even for someone who has a thick skin like I do, it was tough to read. Mm. But it's still one side of the coin, and there's a lot of money involved. We're talking about generational wealth for this young woman mm. and her attorneys and her PR firm. There's a lot of people that are turning her case into a business to maximize the opportunity. And when all you do is listen to that side, as despicable as some of the scenarios we read about were and some of the text messages that were made public and all that, there's still two sides of that coin. Yep. And it still comes down to was it consensual or not? And we haven't heard the other side yet. And I, I refuse to allow the media to manipulate my emotions because it happens too often. Most media is not described, designed to inform you. It's designed to make you feel and become emotional because that's easy. Making people feel is easy. Making people think is much more difficult and not nearly as entertaining. Yeah. So the tendency for media is to always go towards the dirt and creating a, a narrative that's designed to create fear, disgust, joy, whatever it is, it's not necessarily designed to inform. And I recognize that in all forms of media. And as a result, I discipline myself to not buy anybody's line of thinking until I hear both sides of a story or, or investigate something on my own, research it on my own to determine how I think about it, not how I feel about it. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with council culture and this whole idea that you hear one story and suddenly you just have to um, throw away all of someone's lifetime achievements because of one accusation or one act. And, you know, I watched that entire documentary, you know, large part of me, and I was saying this to my wife saying, you know, I'm so thankful to that man. I'm so thankful for what he's given me as a consumer in my life. 35 plus years of escapism and joy are in large parts linked, um, you know, to him, to you, to key people in this business who have given me years of escapist entertainment. And you can't, you can't lose sight of that because of other elements. It's, it is a very strange dichotomy, but I will circle back to what you said in terms of the production. I thought the production was excellent. If if what essentially it was, was a documentary of why is wrestling fantastic and what's happened in the last 40 years, well, it nailed it. And it did that in six hours, which is a feat. But what was quite interesting about some of the editing was obviously the narrative they were, that they were weaving in very fast fashion to bring everyone on this chronological journey. And one sound about some bike that really jumped out at me, which pertains to you, was it's kind of talking about the the dying days of WCW of the last year or so. And it jumped to a a, a clip from Booker T. Um and and he said that you dropped the ball. And obviously that's not the first time I've heard something similar. Um, you know, but that statement doesn't really take into account the kind of macro context of what was going on with Turner as an organization during the AOL Time Warner buyout. Um, does it does it kind of frustrate you 25 years on that there's still this element of blame in some camps towards you and the death of WCW? Or is it a bit like water for ducks back at this point, but you've heard it all before? It's a little bit of both, to, to be honest. It used to bother me much more than it does now. <laughs> I've gotten fairly used to it. <laughs> it's been going on for a long time. But I also recognize, and look, Booker T is a friend of mine. If I ran into him, you know, in, in a city anywhere, you know, I'd look forward to sitting down and having a, having a beer and eating a steak. You know, it's, it's, we have a good relationship. 
And listen, you know, Hulk Hogan is one of my best friends. I've heard Hulk Hogan say similar things. And I recognize that from their perspective, they only know what they know. They had no visibility into what was going on in Turner Broadcasting. They had no visibility into the business of the wrestling business at that time. They only knew what they experienced and what they experienced was as a performer. Now they were affected by some of the things that were going on and some of them negatively affected for sure. The, the, even just the chaos and the, the lack of continuity and the lack of quality storytelling and, you know, the crazy creative that was taking place because quite frankly, the wheels were falling off the creative efforts as a result of a lot of other things. But they don't know the other things. They only know their little their world. So I recognize that. And because I recognize it, I don't take it personally because I don't think their intention is. I think their intentions are fine. They're explaining what they saw and what they think based on what they know. Unfortunately, what they know or what they knew was so severely limited. It would be the same as I'm a private pilot, or I was. I haven't. I haven't flown in a while, long while. But at one time, I was a instrument rated pilot. I had my own plane. I was certified to fly high performance complex aircraft. Instrument rated, if I didn't mention that, I was at a fairly high level with close to a thousand hours of airtime under my belt as a pilot. That doesn't mean that I can analyze or pass judgment on the operations of a major airline because I only know what I know and that's how to fly a plane, but I don't know how to run an airline. And it's the same thing. I think with wrestlers in, in this context is sure. They were in the ring. They know a lot about how to perform. They know a lot about how to manipulate the audience and create the emotion that a movie creates or that a book creates, or even a television commercial can create, right? All of them are designed to create a reaction. And when it comes to the art of creating reactions in the ring, guys like Booker T are some of the best in the world at it. But that doesn't mean they know what, what's going on in the business of business because they're, that's not their world. Just like running an airline isn't my world, even though I'm a pilot. I'm totally unqualified to talk about the operational successes or failures of major airlines just because I'm a pilot. So I, I, I take it. I wish it was, I wish they wouldn't say those things. And, and, and it doesn't look at this point in my life, nothing they say is going to change my life one way or the other for better or for worse. It just is what it is. So I don't get emotional about any of it, but I do kind of deep down inside wish that people would kind of hit that critical thinking part of their brain and go, wait a minute, is there more to this than I understand? What, what don't I know? Hmm. Now, knowing what you don't know is, for me at least, key to life. If you think you know everything and you're willing to come out and stand, stand up tall and profess your absolute commitment to an idea without having asked yourself, what don't I know yet? And spending a little bit of time with, like I said, your critical thinking hat on, yeah, you, more, more often than not, you kind of make yourself look a little yeah, I agree. Less than astute. <laughs> yeah, and also it's with, with with you know what I mentioned with Booker T and and all that kind of thing. It's it's the art of the edit again, isn't it? You don't know how much, many things he was asked leading up to that, and then obviously as soon as you juxtapose it with silly footage of some of the dafter things that were happening in WCW, it all becomes a wonderful sure. narrative. Of and course, that may have happened. And of course, you, you you cast aside many of the silly things that were happening in the WWF in the year 2000 um, because it fits the narrative. Um, thing that uh, obviously we're talking about people who appeared on the documentary. So, so um, obviously your, your good friend Hulk Hogan was all over that documentary and rightly so, because the two were so synonymous for so long. Um, but it leads me on to a question I didn't get a chance to ask you about last time, because in your, in your book, grateful little plug again, um, there's a whole chapter dedicated to your, your close friend of 30 plus years, Terry Belair, um, I wondered how the relationship between you has evolved over all, all the time you've known one another. Like when you first pitched this idea in 1994, 
when he's filming Thunder in Paradise for him to come to WCW. Um, did you feel like you had to, it took a while to earn his trust? Did you feel like you two connected instantly or do you feel like you had to really battle to earn the trust there? Both. Um, I don't think Hulk started to really trust me intimately, meaning when we would sit down and have a conversation about how to do an interview, about an interview in particular or creative or any aspect of the business, that took a long time. As it, as it should have, because I didn't, look, when I first started talking to Hulk back in 1994, I had never run a wrestling company before. I would never accomplished anything in the past. I had no track record. I was this young new kid that people heard about, kid. I was close to 40, but compared to now, I was a kid. But I was so new to the scene that nobody in their right mind should have trusted me. I wouldn't have trusted me just because I didn't have the knowledge and the experience to go, you know, he did this and he did this and he did this. So, oh, okay. He's got some credibility. I'll, I'll, I'll give some trust here. I didn't, I had nothing. And I just popped up out of nowhere with this wrestling company that I was running. And it took a, now on a personal level, we connected very quickly on a personal level. I think he appreciated, you know, we, we became friends fairly quickly and we socialized fairly often outside of wrestling. Like my family would go down to Tampa over the 4th of July and our families would spend time together and, you know, barbecuing or going out to eat or taking a ride on his boat and all that kind of stuff. His kids, my kids, our wives never once talked about wrestling. So that part of our relationship evolved very quickly, but the trust part when it came to business is one of the more difficult things to achieve with Hulk Hogan because of the position that he's been in for as long as he's been in it and having the multitude of wrestling promoters, in my case, a producer, promoter, whatever you want to call it throughout Hulk's career, he had been manipulated, taken advantage of disappointed along the way by people that he did trust. I have heard often stories long ago, about when, when Hulk first got to WCW and we would talk about his time in, in WWE, one of the things that came up occasionally was the fact that Hulk felt like he should have been, he should have been a partner with Vince. He should have had equity in WWE because Hulk felt, and rightfully so, that he was at least partly responsible for the success of WWE. And Vince would never acknowledge that. So there was always this, and still is to this day, who's really responsible for the success of WWE? Mm. Was it Vince McMahon solely? Was it Hulk Hogan solely? The truth, in my opinion, is they're both joined at the hip in that regard. Hulk, Vince could not have done it. Vince would not, could not, possibly have achieved what he achieved early on in those critical years without Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. It would not have happened. Conversely, Hulk Hogan would have never be become the international. He was one of the most famous people in the world at some point. Now, not the most, but one of most recognizable, I should say. Hulk Hogan could have never achieved that without Vince McMahon. No, but so I'm, it was such a know. it's such a symbiotic kind of thing, but Hulk felt like, hey, and, and in fact, asked for it. I remember Hulk, you know, relaying to me the conversation, his version of it, um, where he went to Vince and said, "Hey, brother," because I mean, Hulk moved from Florida up to Connecticut. Which, if you're not from the United States and you don't know some people that grew up in Florida, to pick up your shit and move to Connecticut from Tampa, Florida, living on the beach. It's a major thing. Yeah. <laughs> and Hulk dropped everything, moved to Connecticut, lived very close in proximity to, to Vince because they worked together so closely in those early years. And Hulk at one point during that period of time went to Vince and said, Vince, I think I own, I think I deserve a piece of this company. Mm. And Vince shut him down. Like there was not even a conversation about it. it he just shut it down instantly. 
And because of that, and in other situations, not as extreme as that or as obvious as that, but others, from, you know, whether it be Vern Gagne, Hulk Hogan left the AWA and went to WWE because Vern Gagne wouldn't share in the revenue that was being created with Hulk Hogan merchandise, which was blowing off the shelves. Mm. Vern was greedy. Vern believed that since, hey, I pay you to show up for these events, I get to make money however I can. Yeah. As opposed to saying, okay, Hulk, you're, you're a special case. I've never sold these many T-shirts, never sold this much merchandise in, in the history of my company. Yeah, let's split the let's split it. Let's share in the revenue. I'll give you 10% of what I get or 50% of what I get. Mm-hmm. Vern wouldn't do it. Absolutely shut Hulk down, similar to the way Vince did. Mm-hmm. So Hulk left Vern and went to Vince. Vern did that to himself by being greedy. But that's an example of some of the things that happened throughout Hulk's career that just embedded it within him, uh, an inherent distrust of promoters. Mm-hmm. So, and, so for me, it took me a long time to overcome some of those issues, but we did yeah. by 1997 or so. There was, a, there were so many circumstances where obviously that trust was there. Fast forward to long after WCW, long after all of this, we're talking about the early two thousands when Terry Hulk, going through the divorce, his son was involved in a tragic car accident and, His life was turning upside down. He was spinning, when I say spinning out of control, there was just so much going on around him that he had a hard time managing it all. In addition to what I would consider, if if it was me, depression, because my life was collapsing around me. I was worried about my kids, worried about his reputation, worried about losing everything to his wife through the divorce environment. At one point, hesitate but this has been made public previously so i'll say it uh at one point hulk turned over control of all his assets to me in order to protect himself from lawsuits or his wife so there was a there was a point in time that's when i could have bought i could have bought fiji (laughs) yeah i would have changed the name to something else no i I like fiji would have been a cool name (laughs) But my, my point is that trust after he, after everything at WCW, there was a point in time when I managed all of Hulk's trademarks. And when I say managed, he basically told me, you speak for me. If there's an offer and you think it's good, you can sign that offer on my behalf. Mm, that's that's a lot of trust, but it took a long time to get there. And I want to want to cycle back a little bit. So, so you're talking about like you know who built WWF? Was it Vince? Was it Hulk? Was it a combination of the two? There's the same question goes around about Hulkamania, and and just kind of going back to kind of watching that documentary of my wife. I mean, we're just there, and it's obviously chronicling the 70s, the territory systems, the 70s. It gets the Hulk. The second you see Terry on screen for the first time, you're just like, wow. And I think that's always the thing. That Hulkamania obviously was an incredible, incredible marketing initiative, but it takes terrible ear to make that happen. You know, he he is a a, a kind of one of a kind specimen, enigma, charismatic human being, whatever you want to call him. But there is something you can't not look at him when he's on a screen, and that was abundantly obvious in the AWA, and. Yes, I know the WWF obviously doubled down on it, but that blueprint was well and truly already there, wasn't it, by 1983? It was there. I mean, the charisma, the look, just the aura of Hulk Hogan back in the AWA was evident. It was evident to Vern. It was evident to Vince McMahon Jr. Um, And there's not been... Look, you can look at The Rock and you can say arguably and defensively biggest star in the history of the wrestling business. Mm -hmm. But if you really are thinking about it, would the rock have ever happened if Hulkamania never happened? Mm -hmm. Would the WWE, the way we see it today, even exist had Hulk Hogan not been the right guy at the right place at the right time? And the same can be said for Vince McMahon. 
it was Vince's vision and single-minded obsession to achieve a specific goal that allowed Hulk Hogan to create Hulkamania, but you couldn't have created it without Hulk Hogan because yeah. there was nobody else like him at the time. Nice. And that's that symbiotic kind of relationship those two are going to go to their graves with. Neither one of them are ever going to acknowledge that they couldn't have done it without the other. Mm. Um, but, but also, you're, you're, you know, Vince did one thing, but you also helped do the impossible to a degree, which was obviously turning Hulk Hogan into the biggest heel of all time. And by the time that that conversation comes up in 1996, is the trust there between you? Or is it is it very much, this is a gamble, this could work, or this could be... <laughs> This could be the end. Because it was you know, such a gamble, wasn't it? it? It was a big gamble. In a way, it was a gamble. So here's a little bit of backstory on that. I had, you know, Hulk came in in 1994, and there was the predictable reaction. It's Hulk Hogan. He's here at WCW. That started to wear off after a couple of months. Once the new car smell went away, so to speak, the newness was no longer there. And people were now accustomed to seeing Hulk Hogan in WCW. There became a significant part of the audiences that was like, yeah, but you're not Ric Flair. Because Ric Flair was loved by the WCW audience. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind that Hulk Hogan always represented the WWE and the to the hardcore WCW fans, Vince McMahon was the enemy. Mm. They were they were the 800 pound gorilla, and little WCW was fighting to to survive in the minds of yeah. some of that audience. Right? It's just like a football team. You know, people get extraordinarily passionate about some aspects of of their fandom that is a little bit wacky, but they started looking at Hulk differently, and you started to hear negative reactions to him. You still get cheers and hey, it's Hulk Hogan because he's such a big star. But there was also a segment of the WCW audience that were starting to boo him. And we weren't getting the reaction that we wanted to get out of Hulk. So that was towards the end of 94, early 95, throughout 95. At some point, either in late 95 or early 1996, I was living in Atlanta at the time and I had my plane. And I flew down to Tampa for a meeting with, with Terry. Went to his house, middle of the afternoon. His kids were in school. His wife wasn't home. We sat down, walked in. He had a big, beautiful home on the ocean, on the beach. We sat down in his office, handed me a beer. We started talking. And I came there with the intention of trying to convince Hulk to at least consider turning heel. Because I knew as a producer and as someone that was listening to the audience, we weren't getting what we wanted to get. And I sat down and I explained to Hulk, here's my thinking. I didn't have any creative plan in mind at the time. I just wanted to get him to buy into the idea of it and then pursue the idea mm -hmm. of turning him here. So I went down to try to set the stage a little bit and Hulk listened very, very, he was very gracious, never interrupted me, had no idea what he was really thinking or feeling. He, he's a good poker player in that respect. And I got all done, and Hulk looked at his watch. He says, you know, Eric, it's about 3 o'clock. My kids are out of school. I got to go pick them up. Thank you very much for coming down, and I appreciate what you had to say, but you'll never understand Hulk Hogan until you walk a mile in my red and yellow boots. Hmm. See ya. And you can take that beer with you if you'd like. <laughs> Just so it. It, it was the nicest I've ever been thrown out of someone's house in my life. That was approximately six or eight months before Scott showed up and Kevin showed up. Mm. Scott showed up first, then it was Kevin. Then we started the, who's the third man? That part of the storyline. Well, that part of the storyline was playing out. Hulk Hogan was off in Northern California, up in the mountains, producing a Christmas movie. So Hulk, was, and Hulk wasn't even scheduled to be involved in anything because we only had him for four pay-per-views a year at that time. He wasn't scheduled to be involved in anything until probably October. So, and this was, you know, June, probably, somewhere in late June, early July. In the meantime, Jimmy Hart, who's always been kind of an assistant 
for Hulk forever was taping the Monday Nitro shows on VHS and then FedExing them to Hulk up in the mountains in Northern California so Hulk could stay up to date with what was going on in WCW. So Hulk sitting in his trailer, sequestered on a movie set in the middle of nowhere, California, watching Scott come down, watching Kevin show up, mm-hmm. and then realizing that we're creatively, we're going to build this whole thing around who's the third man. Now, I had Sting convinced to be the third man because Hulk had thrown me out of his house six months prior. I wasn't even going to go to Hulk. I wasn't even going to bring it up. He'd already turned down the opportunity to, or, or the suggestion, I should say, of turning heel. So I immediately went to Sting, convinced Sting to be the third man. That was the original plan. But while Hulk was up in California, sequestered on a lot of a Christmas movie, on the set of a Christmas movie, he's watching these tapes and he went, huh, that's pretty cool. I think I should be the third man. So I think to answer your question as best I can, it wasn't necessarily trust in Eric Bischoff that convinced Hulk that he should be the third man and turn heel. It was the storyline as it was being played out proved to be trustworthy. Mm. So it wasn't me that was trustworthy. It was the opportunity that he saw being pre- developed without him that made him go, that's a good idea. It should be me, not stick. No. And that's what happened. The, the UK- Hulk, and I'll, I'll finish the story because it's a funny story because yeah. it's very similar to when I flew down and tried to convince him to turn heel in the first place. So Hulk calls me and I, I'm in Atlanta. I'm running a company. I'm busy as hell. I'm doing live TV on Monday nights. I got pay-per-views once a month. I'm a little busy. I got a hundred employees and 120 wrestlers under contract. Hulk calls me, goes, Eric, I can't leave LA because I'm doing this movie. Is there any chance you could come out? Cause I'd like to talk to you. He didn't tell me what he wanted to talk about, but I went, man, he's Hulk Hogan. He's my biggest star. You have to manage talent. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes you got to do shit you don't want to do, but you got to manage your talent. So I said, sure, Hulk, I'm coming right out. The next day I jumped on a plane. I landed in Los Angeles about nine o'clock at night. I had to drive two and a half hours to get where he was up in the mountains, middle of nowhere, California. Finally get to the location. I go to Hulk's trailer. It's midnight, 1230. I'm beat. I've been flying all day. I go into Hulk's trailer and he's sitting there. He's got a case of beer sitting on a table next to a box of Cuban cigars. <laughs> he's got a big cigar. He's waiting for me. And I finally show up. I say, have a seat. Here, grab a beer. And I'm sitting there and I say, so what's up, brother? He goes, who's the third man? Now, I knew Hulk well enough at that point. I absolutely trusted him, and I, I would trust him with my life to this day. But I also know he's somewhat like a little kid when he gets excited. And he just bubbles over and starts saying things that he probably should keep to himself because you don't want the world knowing what you're doing creatively, no matter how excited you are about it. You know, I'm that way too. I've, I've done this myself. That's why I, I, I see it so quickly in others because I'm guilty of it too. Mm-hmm. When I get excited about something, the first thing I want to do is share it with people that I love or respect and, and just out of enthusiasm. And I'm thinking if I tell Hulk, it's going to be staying there's a good chance in his excitement, enthusiasm, enthusiasm or whatever, he's going to say something that somebody's going to overhear. And then it's going to blow my mystery. The cat will be out of the bag. So the hawk says, so who's the third man? He leans forward. He says, oh, brother, who's the third man? I sat back and I had to make a decision. I'm either going to tell him and risk it or I'm going to bob and weave because I didn't want to tell him. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my wife. Wow. I didn't tell anybody. Nobody on the booking committee, nobody in my office. Sting knew that it was going to be Sting. 
Nobody else knew. Kevin Sullivan didn't know. I wanted to keep a secret, which is really hard to do in a wrestling business. Yeah. And it's not that I didn't trust those other people. It's just that they're all guilty of the same thing I can be guilty of from time to time. Mm-hmm. So I think the only way, you know, there's, there's an old saying, the only way, you know, two people can keep a secret is if one of them is dead. So I'm, I said, okay, I'm not going to, I can't tell them. I can't tell them because they're going too good. So my, my response was, when you said, oh, brother, who's it going to be? Who's the third man? My response was, who do you think it should be? <laughs> it's like, answer a question with a question, right? Basic shit. And he leaned in, doing the thing with the Fu Manchu, which is either a really good sign or a really bad sign. He starts stroking his Fu Manchu. Something's coming. You just don't know if it's going to be good or bad. He's winding up. He's getting it ready to deliver the ball, so to speak. And I sat back and he went, you're looking at him, brother. Uh, so it was his decision. I didn't convince him to do it. I created the opportunity that he saw that was an undeniable opportunity for him to do something that deep down inside, even back in January, whenever it was, when I tried to convince him, he knew I was right, but I didn't have the solution. Here, I provided the solution before I even had the conversation. And he jumped in and then it was like, I knew that was the right, that was the right opportunity. There was no question. Turning Hulk Hogan heel in this storyline, I knew would be a big deal. I didn't know how big, but I knew it would be big. So immediately I said, Hulk, if you're in, if you're really in and you're not going to change your mind on me, let's do it. Soon as I got in my car, I went to go back to my hotel so I could go back to Atlanta the next day. On my way back to LA, I'm thinking, oh, I just spent three weeks convincing Sting that he should turn heel, which he'd never done before. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't an easy, it wasn't hard, but it wasn't easy because Sting, Steve Borden is a very pragmatic, thoughtful person who doesn't agree to anything right away. It takes him a long time to, to think through things and get comfortable. But I'm thinking, I spent three weeks convincing Sting this is the right opportunity. Now I get to go back to Atlanta and call Sting and have him come to my office so that I can tell him we're going to go with Hulk Hogan instead. And I, I, and I say that, I make light of it in this recollection of everything, but that was a hard conversation to have with Sting. Mm, I've always wondered, was, he, a, was he disappointed? Because presumably at this point he geared himself up that he was going to go heal and change his whole direction. How, how does that conversation go? It went fine. I think, I mean, I've never talked to Steve about this, so I can just give you my impressions. My impression was part of him was relieved because it was a big risk for Sting. Hmm. And and like I said, Sting is, Steve is a very pragmatic, thoughtful, he thinks like an engineer as opposed to a wrestler. Hmm. He's very analytical. And I think there were still some questions in, in Steve's mind of how it was going to affect not only his career, but his kids. He had young kids. And I know that sounds silly to people that aren't in the business, but the line between fiction and reality in the wrestling business, especially back then in WCW, was a very blurry line. And it worked creatively. It was one of the reasons it worked so well. But also, it made it hard to distinguish the character in the ring and the real human being especially with kids. And Steve Borden had very young kids at the time. I think that was a concern in addition to the career choice. So part of him was relieved, but part of him also recognized this is one of the biggest things that had ever happened in his career. The whole NWO initiative was start, got so hot so fast that he was probably a little disappointed too. So I would say he was relieved in some ways, but also disappointed in others. But he was a pro. He was because the truth is, I didn't know for sure that Hulk Hogan would stick to it. Hulk, and and I would say this if he was sitting here next to me and he would laugh and chuckle because he knows I'm right. He can change his mind three times over the course of two days. He he'll second guess himself. It's his biggest, his biggest internal challenge in life is that 
He second guesses himself frequently. And the same thing was true for, for Hulk. Now, Hulk knew creatively this is the best opportunity. But Hulk was also making, I don't know, a couple million a year on things outside of wrestling mm-hmm. because of that Hulk Hogan character, that red and yellow character. Mm-hmm. That was still a very viable licensing opportunity for things outside of wrestling, television commercials, movie deals, all of that was based on the Hulk Hogan persona. Hulk knew that if he changed that persona, especially to be a heel, there was a good chance that a lot of that was going to go away. Mm. That was a financial risk that he had to consider, which is probably one of the reasons he threw me out of his house back in January. <laughs> Cause he's just doing math in his head. Going, I'm not going to risk all this because you got an idea like that go home. <laughs> And I understood that, but Hulk also saw the opportunity, but was also cognizant of the fact that if, if he was wrong and this turn wasn't the biggest thing that happened in the wrestling business in 20 years or so, it could also be the end of his career, or at least the end of a lot of the financial opportunities that he had built over the past previous 20 years. I've always been curious as a, as a UK wrestling fan, because there's a, there's a, I know you're, your good friend Bruce Pritchard doesn't deal in, in rumor and innuendo, and neither do you. But this is something that did the rounds a lot at the time in, you know, Power Slam over here in the UK and all the dirt sheets and everything. This idea that Davy Boy Smith may have been the third man. Was that ever actually a discussion in 96? Or was that absolutely, absolutely, absolutely not? No, never. Not, not with me. Now, Davy might have talked to some people about it, or maybe somebody else on the creative team said, hey, we'd. Before they knew that, because keep in mind, a lot of people didn't know it was going to be Hulk. A lot of people on the creative team didn't know it was going to be Sting. Mm. I kept that shit a secret. So while we're creating this third man mystery, because that's what this was, this was a mystery storyline. Um, while we're creating this mystery, and because people didn't know I'd already locked Sting down, or that now I had Hulk Hogan too, they were probably probing asking questions, whether a talent coming, it would have been Kevin Sullivan, who was my head of creative at the time. Kevin might've been exploring options to bring to me. Talent might've been coming to Kevin yeah. because everybody saw that this is going to be big. So there might've been some peripheral conversations with regard to Davy boy, but certainly nothing that ever reached my level or, or that I was involved. Was, was Bret Hart ever considered? Never. Time? No. Absolutely. No. I don't think anybody even, I, I can't imagine anybody even had that thought consciously. I, um, it's quite interesting, you know, when it, when you kind of look back at that time period, because there were so many different moving parts and, you know, it, it could have gone so many different ways, but obviously it ended up being this incredible runaway success. And obviously Sting, who, probably was somewhat disappointed at the time, ended up benefiting massively from being the one big opposition. Right. WO. You know, I mean, it's Ar- hard arguably, to <laughs> arguably Sting's character and, and its trajectory reached a higher level than it probably would have if he would have been the third man. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to get your perspective on, um, and I know you've, I'll, I'll put a fresh spin on this, hopefully, because you've been asked this so many times, but you know, when you get to the payoff of Starcade 97 after a year and a half of incredible episodic slow burn storyline, and you finally get to the big payoff match of Hogan Sting, um, and obviously the trains come off the track in a few different directions. And, I, you know, I've obviously heard talk about, um, you know, Sting not being really ready for a match mentally or physically. And then there was the, the, the regular count that was supposed, uh, supposed to be a fast count and many elements. Where, where do you kind of land on, on that match of, of Starcade 97 in terms of did it do what it needed to do or. You know, what's so funny about that, man. And I'm glad you asked that question because even over the course of the last year or two, like, I don't think he'd mind if I reveal this, but I had a conversation with Cody Rhodes maybe a year or so ago and Cody was there, you know, Dusty was still a part of the team. Cody as a young boy was there at ringside. The whole fast count, all of the things that we've all learned subsequent to that night, 
that are part of wrestling folklore at this point. But that night, from the eyes of a young kid by the name of Cody Rhodes, who's going on to become what Cody Rhodes has become, he said, Eric, I did I was ecstatic. I love the finish. Now we've learned subsequent to that night that a lot the the wheels fell off and there's a lot of confusion and the fast count and all that drama, but none of that was obvious to the audience in the moment, at least not to the people at ringside. Mm. I don't know how people at home felt, um, but Cody never understood the controversy. He loved the finish. Yeah, he didn't see that. He didn't see the confusion and mistakes, frankly and the lack of communication that resulted in all the controversy. As a fan sitting at ringside, he was reacting to what he saw, and what he saw absolutely satisfied him. He could never understand the controversy until much later. So, look, the original plan was for Sting to go over. Clean. No shenanigans, no fast counts, no reversing up decisions, no bullshit, no run-ins. It was originally designed to be a great match with a definitive non-controversial finish. But because of things that happened throughout the day, we, we had to change those plans. Had we gone with the original plan, I think it would have gone down as to one of the greatest storylines ever told. But because the end of the movie was a little f***ed up, we, we kind of lost that opportunity. But it was like, I will never get away from this finish or my responsibility in it. And I, I don't want to try to, it's just one of those things that happened. And we made the best, we, we made the best decision we could at the time, given the circumstances. But how, how did you feel on the night? You know, when it's all said and done, things there surrounded by his WCW brethren and, you know, you have paid one way or another, you've managed to pay off this story arc that you conceived 18, you know, almost 18 months previously you know, is there a feeling of, ah, oh, we did it, or we got through that, or are you just on to the next thing? Sting's champion now. What do we do next? It was a it was a combination of emotions. Obviously, I was disappointed that we couldn't go with the original plan. Mm. I, I recognized immediately that what we were about to do was a less than scenario than ideal. What we started out with was ideal. It was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. From a storytelling perspective, it was flawless. From, from the perspective of the emotion that we created, the engagement that we, we created, it was as close to flawless as flawless could be. Hmm. But I knew, because of the compromise that we had to make, that what we were going to do was less than. However, because the end shot was staying, standing in the ring and WCW fan or WCW you know, wrestlers and everybody coming out to congratulate him. We got that high spot moment that Cody Rhodes felt at ringside. We satisfied the audience. We paid it off. And the audience didn't see the flaws that night. The audience didn't recognize the flaws until the controversy that percolated afterwards. Yeah. And, this- that, and I knew I knew it was a compromise. I'm never said I don't like compromises. I always want to go with an ideal solution, but sometimes you can't, and you have to do the next best thing. So I was as happy as I could be, knowing we did the next best thing. Yeah, and I think you know it's, it's interesting what you say about Cody because some there is something to be said for just naively enjoying wrestling. Yeah. without knowing everything going on. I, I I had a long conversation with Nick Aldis before where I said to Nick, I really miss the days when I was a 10-year-old wrestling fan. And he was like, yeah, me too. I just really wish, miss when I used to just turn on my hour of Monday Night Raw, escape into wrestling, and then turn it off again, not knowing anything about the people behind the product. And there's something for, I think there's something as an adult wrestling fan we can take away from that, but actually sometimes just get lost in it and just enjoy what it is. And you know, you don't always have to know everything about the wheelings and dealings behind the scene. Just enjoy the performance that's going on out there. It's a double-edged sword in a way. As a producer, you want your audience to be so engaged in what you're presenting 
that you want that conversation. You, you know, we used to call it water cooler buzz. You know, when we put on a Monday Nitro and we do something that was so good or controversial in some cases, the next day, kids in school would be talking about it. People at work would, you know, meet at the water cooler. Did you watch Nitro last night? Do you believe what they did? Yeah. You, you aspire to that. You want to create that sense of off-show kind of engagement and conversation. And the wrestling fans around the world, frankly, are some of the most loyal fans in the world of entertainment. You'll find the same level of passion in sports, but outside of sports in general entertainment, it doesn't exist the way it exists in wrestling. The desire to, I've often said that people are more interested in what's going on behind the scenes than they are what's going on really in the ring. I'm one of those people. Mm, I still watch wrestling today. I don't really, it's hard to get my interest in terms of matches, but I love trying to see where the business is going. What changes are taking place in the way of show is formatted? What mm. changes are taking place and how may it affect the business overall by going from, oh, I don't know, Fox Network to Netflix? Yeah. What impact is that going to have three years from now? What impact do all the things that involve a wrestling show from a business perspective what am I seeing that gives me an idea of what the future is going to look like? I often say that if I have any natural abilities or instincts, because I'm not the smartest guy in the world. You know, I went to high school technically, but I only went so that I had enough attendance to be able to be on the wrestling team. Once the wrestling season was over, I had two jobs. I'd show up at school in the mornings to make sure that I got a little check by my name for attendance. And I turn around, walk out the door and go to work. Mm. I, they, I graduated from high school. Why? I have no idea. You know, and I excelled at some things. You know, I was, I did really well in history because I love history. I did really well in uh, German because I loved the idea of being able to speak another language and learning another culture. I actually went over to Germany my senior year for a short time as a foreign exchange student, lived with a German family that didn't speak English and Really? Black Forest in an agricultural part of Germany, just to immerse myself in the culture and in the language. So I excelled at certain things that I was, I was, I loved physics. Now I sucked at math because I hated math, but I loved the idea of the concepts in physics. So I actually did pretty well in physics for a guy that could barely pass a math class. <laughs> but really, I should have never graduated. I went to college much the same for the same reasons. Uh, I wanted to wrestle. I wanted to hang out with my friends who were all going off to college to party and chase women. And I didn't want to be left at home, you know, working a construction job where my buddies were all chasing women, getting drunk and having fun. So I went to college. What's the same way I went to high school. (laughs) And so that didn't last very long. But one of the things that I have learned as an entrepreneur and one that's been fairly successful on average through the course of my life. I've had my ups, I had my downs and everything in between, but I'm really good at seeing patterns. And I see, I have an ability to connect dots and create pictures out of random patterns pretty well. Mm. And I love watching I love looking for the dots within the business of the wrestling business and trying to connect those dots to predict the future. That's why I watch wrestling. So I watch it completely different than the average fan does. I relate to it differently. Now, had I never been a producer, had I never run a wrestling company, had I never done what I did with WCW, I might be sitting at home with a, with a beer and a piece of pizza and just watching wrestling to escape. Yeah, well, when when I watch wrestling, wrestling, I don't watch it to escape. I watch it to see where it's going business-wise. Yeah, and I have to program my mind to sit there with a beer and pizza, to be honest, sometimes just to go, I'm just going to enjoy this. I have to switch off. But look, I've got one more question for today. Um, we will do a part three. I haven't even started to ask you about TNA or WWE. So we, we've gone right down WCW today, but that's as it should be. Um, my last question, because there won't be a contextual reason for me to ask you again. It makes complete sense as we, talk, we just talked to Starcade 97. 
I want to ask you about Brett Hart, but I want to ask you about Brett Hart in a way that hopefully you haven't generally been asked this before. So I, you know, I asked this without agenda, just out of curiosity as an interviewer, but you know, I lay my cards on the table and being transparent. I'm a lifelong, you know, Brett Hart was my guy. I'm a lifelong Brett Hart fan. I also am old enough to appreciate there are two sides to every story and every coin. Um, but for me, when when I was watching, I was watching WWF and WCW in tandem over in the UK. And, you know, obviously coming off the back of Montreal, you know, I was, you know, obviously very disappointed as running WCW, as I think everyone was, including you. Um, but coming off the back of Montreal, it just felt that his debut was so kind of understated. And um, I know you've said in, in a number of interviews when being asked about this that, you know, Brett wasn't the same person when he arrived at WCW and that his heart wasn't in it. Um, but I guess my question to you isn't, isn't there also potentially an argument that perhaps he would have been more engaged if he'd been programmed more strongly from the beginning? And, and I guess my bigger question is rather than him kind of being part of that kind of angle with you and Larry Zabisco at Starcade and then being in the convoluted finish, was there ever a consideration to maybe holding off his debut and going straight into the kind of Hogan Hitman match, which I think had been the dream match for a lot of fans since, since the early nineties, or was it just a case of we've got him, we need to do something with him this is an opportunity to kick him off in the right way. So I ask that about, with completely without agenda. I'm just curious. No, that's a very, very good question. And I'll, I'll do my best to answer it as honestly as I can, knowing that I'm somewhat biased. Sure. <laughs> Got to acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, look, what people need to keep in mind, first and foremost, is Bret Hart coming into WCW wasn't part of a plan. Red Hart coming to WCW was a part of a circumstance. It was the result of a circumstance. It had nothing to do with me. That was because Vince decided he couldn't afford the commitment that he had made to Brett. Mm. I didn't know that until after it happened. It's not like we had six months to sit back and say, or even three months to sit back and say, okay, Brett's coming. What's the best way to use Brett? Which you would have had in 1996, wouldn't you? If he'd originally signed when it was discussed, you would have had time to think, where do I program him in? I've got the NWO. Exactly. We've got this really new hot hill stable. He's the three-time WWF champion and a, and a huge baby face. You probably would have had time to think, well, he's an obvious opponent to the NWO, I would have thought, in that era. At some point down the road. With someone like Brett and the opportunity that, that came with Brett, in 96, we would have had that time. We have proven that at that time, we were planning long-term. We were planning big things far enough in advance to do an adequate job or even a great job executing them. But when Brett became available, that was like spontaneous. It wasn't a part of a plan. Now, I could have said, sorry, Brett, you know, I need more time. I know you're getting cut loose. And I can't make a commitment to you until we have a plan in place because you're coming with a big paycheck. But instead, and this is the, this would be my fault. This would be my responsibility. Instead, I tried to make the best out of the situation by going, wait a minute. This is Bret Hart. He's just coming off the Montreal screw job, which was the biggest, most controversial moment at that time worldwide. What I chose to do was to exploit that fact so that Bret Hart, the character, would do the right thing as a referee because he's a righteous, honest person that had been through getting screwed over by a referee. So unfortunately, yeah, Bret had to wear a referee shirt, which kind of took him down a lot. Clearly, and that was a mistake of mine. But I couldn't put him in the position to right a wrong as a referee who had as a performer, as a major, as a superstar who had been screwed over by a dirty referee. And that character seeing a dirty referee fast count, knowing what he had just come through and been a part of the Montreal screw job, would be the 
thing that would make the character Bret Hart say, screw this, I will not let this happen to another human being. Mm. That was my logic to use Re Bret as a referee, as a means to kind of exploit and take advantage of the fact and make Bret a hero. Mm. Could Can anybody say, yeah, but there would be a better way to use Bret than that? Sure. And they'd be right. But under the circumstances where I didn't have time to plan, we wanted to bring, Brett wanted to get back to, he wanted to, he wanted a paycheck. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested in sitting around talking about it for three or four months. Yeah. He had to make a decision. Does he let Vince out of the contract? Because Brett could have stood up to Vince and said, no, brother, see this piece of paper with your name on it? Mm -hmm. you. Here's what we're going to do. And here's how we're going to do it. But I didn't want to do that. He didn't want to be in that position. He wanted to make a move. I facilitated that, even though I had no time to plan for it. And I made the best out of the situation at that time I thought I could make. Mm. In retrospect, it wasn't that good. In retrospect. But in that moment, yeah. under those circumstances, if there was a way that I could go back in time knowing what I know now, I would have made a different choice. But to be really honest, and this is what people have a hard time with, being honest with themselves, if you put yourself, if one puts oneself in my shoes, in that moment, with that information, under those conditions, I'm not proud of my decision, but I'm not embarrassed by it either. I did the best I could with what I had in that moment. Incredible. I used the best judgment I, I had in that moment. Credit where it's due. I mean, I, I loved his first match. His first, I, I believe his first official match with WCW was the match he had it sold out with Ric Flair, which I thought was tremendous. Um, it's just probably not the match I wanted to see because I'd already seen it. Um, you know, and I think you always have as a wrestling fan, you always want the new, don't you? You don't want the, you, you don't want to reruns. You want the, you want the new matchup, which was obviously, the beauty of people coming from WCW to WWF and vice versa. You were like, what dream matches can I have? And for me, that was always Bret and Hogan. But um, that's my Bret Hart question. We've got through that. And I think we've got through it amicably. And, um, you know, as I say, always two signs to every, every coin. And um, hindsight is a wonderful thing. It truly is. It's, you know, if I, if I could take that pill that would give me 2020 hindsight in real time, Holy smokes. The first thing I would do is go to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and after I was done getting clean, cleaning up in Las Vegas and actually getting banned from every casino in, in the state, because I'd walk out with everything they owned, they'd have to name one of the big casinos after me at that point. <laughs> if you had that, if you had that ability to know what you don't know in that moment. Absolutely. Um, but look, I, I, I regret a lot that Brett is as negative as he is. He's a very dark negative person when he talks about certain things. I'm sure there's parts of Brett's life where he's not. But, you know, Brett's always been the kind of guy that's got to be mad at somebody. He hates Vince. He hates Sean. He hates Hebner. He hates Hogan. He hates Bischoff. He hates Goldberg. He hates this guy. He, you know, Brett has a tendency to blame the entire world for whatever goals Brett hasn't achieved that he thought he should. A lot of this responsibility, I know you're a fan of Brett's, and I don't mean to... to sure. To, to be cruel or, or non-feeling about it. But Brett needs to man the f*** up and accept some responsibility for some of the decisions and choices he made. Because Brett could have come in and Brett could have said no. Brett could have said, Eric, I don't think that's the best idea and here's why. He didn't do that. And okay, so, so do. much of it, just to go full circle, so much of it goes back to that Vince McMahon hold that he just seemed to have on people. This you heard time and time again, Vincent Mam was a father figure. Vincent Mam was a father figure. And you know, the situation that happened in Montreal was in many respects a, a contract breaking down. And a well and, and and you don't know Brett personally, or maybe you do, I don't know. But Brett was so caught up in the Canadian hero thing, which is what led to the whole thing at Montreal anyway. Brett should have just done the job. However, Vince wanted to do it. And I told Brett that Brett called me before all this went down because he didn't know what to do. 
didn't know how he didn't want to, he wanted to make sure he got, he, he, he returned the belt in the right way for his character. Yeah. He actually called me and I remember where I was. Um, I, I took the call and I'm listening to Brett and I said, Brett, I don't really care. Do the job anywhere. However, Vince wants you to do it. It doesn't matter. You're Brett freaking hard. The audience knows the score. It's not like people are going to be shocked. Yeah. You are leaving. It's their title. This is how things go. <laughs> and also, there's, no there's, one's there's gonna th- no way you could have risked doing anything with the WWF title anyway, was there? Because you were so caught no. in litigation. You were, there's no way you'd risk that at that time. No. So it, I, I tried so hard to convince because Brett was so emotional mm. about giving up the belt. And I tried to convince him there's no reason to be. You're Bret Hart. You're so much bigger than that belt. Yeah. Absolutely. If anything, you getting you losing is going to make them more excited to see what's going to happen with your future when you get here. They're not going to look at you as damaged goods because you left the belt in WWE. It's childish to think that way. But I will tell you, Bret was so caught up in his Canadian hero legendary status that in his mind because he believes it so much to this day, he was going to let his fans down. That's what led to the Montreal screw drop. It's, you know, I hate to say it, it's going to get you some heat, get me some heat on your show. But when Vince McMahon said Brett screwed Brett, Brett did screw Brett because Brett didn't do business the way Brett should have done business. And Vince was forced to do something that Vince didn't want to do. He was forced to do. And that affected Brett so much emotionally because he was so overly invested in his Canadian hero mm. legendary status that it hurt him emotionally. When he got to WCW, he was depressed. He wasn't, hey, I'm here. Maybe we do someone home. Okay, how do I get involved? There was absolutely zero excitement on his part. Mm. And it wasn't just me that noticed it. Brett would show up a half hour before TV ship would start. He'd come moping in the corner, dragging his bag, and go find a place in the corner of the, room, the locker room to sit down and, and, and barely engage with anybody. That's on Brett. Was my decision, my choice, our decision, our choice, the absolute best it could have been? Of course not. Did Brett help that situation? No, because he was too caught up in his own emotion and sadness and disappointment in his status as a Canadian hero in his fear that his audience would think less of him. That's pretty childish. That's like an actor in a movie that gets shot at the end. And he's afraid the audience is going to be disappointed because their favorite good guy got shot in the end of the movie. It's like, what the I, hell? I think you just nailed it there, Eric, why wrestling is so fascinating and unique because it should be like a film and it should be like a TV series, but it's not. And the, li- the, the lines between fact and fiction are so blurred and that's why we love it. And we've gone a bit over time, but I appreciate it. I'm glad we've, we've been able to talk about that. Um, we're going to do a part three at some point. And when we do, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite genuine storylines of the last 30 years, which is Aces of Eights, which I loved it. Oh, yeah. I loved everything about that. I loved all the stuff with Garrett. So we're going to save that for the next time. Talk some WWE memories. And um, I think we've covered off WCW pretty nicely today. So I appreciate your openness, your honesty, and being on the show. My pleasure, Ben. It's always a guest talking to you. I've had a really good time today. That's it for another Wrestling Life. Thank you so much for my guest today. Thank you to all of you for joining me. Thank you, as always, to my brilliant producer, Jeff Easton from Tall Lake Productions for bringing Wrestling Life to life. We've got so many of these fantastic conversations in our archives, so please do check us out wherever you get your podcasts. And the most important thing of all, please hit that follow button, please like us, please tell a friend, and please talk about us using the hashtag WrestlingLifePod. So that's it for another episode. I've been Benville. This has been Wrestling Life with Benville. I'll see you soon for more real talk from real talent. Bye.